I do want to do a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Ashley Bodkins, and I'm with the University of Extension Office here in Garrett County. And I am joining you this evening from my high tunnel. I don't know if you can see behind me, um, but I do have about 120 tomatoes planted in here in the high tunnel behind me, uh, as, long as, as well as some cabbage, broccoli, and cauliflower. So I thought it'd be fun to, to do the classroom out here since it's a beautiful day and hopefully inspire some people to, to learn some more about tomatoes. Um, you have my colleague with me uh, this evening, Miss Sherry Frick. Uh, Sherry, do you want to unmute and say a quick hello? Sure. Can you hear me? Okay. I am Sherry Frick from University of Maryland Extension. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator in Allegheny County, Maryland. And I'm also the Master Gardener Coordinator like Ashley. So um, I'm assisting her and it's my pleasure to be here today. Awesome. Yeah, and as Sherry said, I do work uh, with Extension as well with um, in, in Garrett County, so the westernmost county uh, in Maryland. So we have quite an interesting uh, climate up here. We live in the mountains, so we're around a 5B on the USDA cold hardiness zone. So we can't even start planting warm season crops like tomatoes until after June. Uh, usually after Memorial Day, the beginning of June is when we start planting up here. So uh, we have a lot of good information I think for you this evening. Uh, we are going to turn our videos off unless we are talking and then maybe even I will turn mine off while I'm talking too just to make sure that we don't have any technical issues. But I did want to start with a quick introduction to the University of Maryland. Uh, so University of Maryland Extension is part of the land grant university system, uh, University of Maryland. College of Agriculture and Natural Resources. And then this is just a flow chart that kind of helps reiterate uh, where Extension falls. And then underneath Extension, of course, is uh, one of the signature programs that Sherry and I both work with, the Maryland Master Gardener Program. So several folks on the call are probably familiar with the Master Gardener Program. If you aren't and want more information, uh, please just let us know. We can talk about it towards the end of the program or you can always follow up with us. Uh, we did have our contact information here on the first slide, our email addresses. Uh, so feel free to uh, reach out to us via email. We will try to keep up with the chat, but uh, if we do miss a question, feel free to enter it again. Uh, we don't miss them on purpose, but sometimes it moves pretty quick. And I did just want to give a quick um, Shout out to John Tronfeld. He is a state vegetable uh, specialist with the University of Maryland Extension and the Home and Garden Information Center. And he put this presentation together originally. Um, Sherry and I have adapted it for our use. Uh, so we did want to give him credit for uh, some of the information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry to give us a brief overview of the history of tomatoes. Okay, so I, I find this kind of stuff lots of fun, but if you'll uh, take a look at this picture on the uh, right side of the, the slide there, I got this postcard at um, an antique shop and it just really made me laugh uh, because it, uh, it's the intersection of antiques and, and the love of gardening. So here you see this suitor uh, trying to woo young woman and at the uh, bottom of the card, it says, the language of vegetables, tomatoes, an acquired taste. Wait, love will come. And I just think that's so funny because she's looking at him thinking he's equivalent to tomatoes. And I'm not really so sure I'm into him. So that's part of the history of tomatoes is, uh, you know, people weren't so sure about them in the beginning and it took a while for them to fall in love with them. Tomatoes used to have the name poison apple. And uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history there. And tomatoes uh, are, are thought to have originated to the tropical highlands of Peru and Southern Ecuador. And eventually they made their way down to Mexico and the Aztec empire. When the Spanish came over to Central America, uh, they took some tomatoes back to Europe and um, Many of the people who started to try and eat the tomatoes, uh, particularly the upper class, thought that the tomatoes were poisonous. And the reason for this is because upper class folks um, used to eat 
on pewter plates and they may have had pewter uh, utensils to eat with and pewter is made with lead or it was at that time. This would be in the 1500s. So the, the acid in the tomatoes actually uh, released lead from the pewter into their food and it resulted in lead poisoning. So that's why uh, many, uh, uh, especially the upper class folks thought that tomatoes were poisonous. Now, um, the tomatoes did make their way over from Europe into colonial America, but they did not really become that popular until we had a, a, a lot of Italian immigrants coming into the country, so maybe mid to late 1800s. All right, Ashley, can you forward it for me one? Okay, then uh, in the 18 hundreds, we had the whole debate about, is this a fruit or a vegetable? And the Supreme Court got involved and weighed in. So um, in 1883, Congress passed a 10% import tax on all vegetables. Now, John Nixon Company, which was located in New York City, was one of the largest uh, produce sellers and importers. And so this tax on tomatoes, you know, hurt him financially. So he came up with an argument that technically tomatoes are a fruit, and that is true botanically speaking. Uh, we, you know, as botanists, uh, we um, describe fruit as anything that has a seed with flesh covering it. Okay, so if if a plant produces a seed and it's covered with flesh, that is considered a fruit. So John Nix filed a suit in 1887, and in six years later, the Supreme Court decided that tomatoes are a vegetable. And this is, it's not based on the botanical definition, but rather on how people use tomatoes, how they use them culinarily speaking. Um, people don't eat tomatoes like a fruit. They eat them as a savory part of uh, their, their food dishes. Okay, Ashley, I'm gonna turn it over to you. All right. Thank you for the history. It's amazing to me that, that tomatoes have been around that long and that no matter, you know, how often we talk about them, we still get a lot of questions. And it is, it is thought that the tomato is the number one grown backyard vegetable for most folks. Uh, anybody who is gardening usually does put a tomato out. So uh, that's why we like to uh, share information about tomatoes. We want everybody to be as successful as possible. So I did want to share a couple facts about uh, the tomato itself. I have the scientific name there, Solanium lycopersicum. Uh, it is a self-pollinating, tender, herbaceous perennial. So a lot of folks are really surprised about that. Um, but once they learn that it's a perennial, it kind of helps to explain why we need to treat them the way we do. Uh, so the other really important part of that sentence, that first uh, statement there, is that it's self-pollinating. So that means that even if we don't have a lot of bees or pollinators helping us out, um, a lot of times we get a lot of the pollination for tomatoes just from the wind or from the rain. Uh, so that's a really good thing. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about is that even though they're a perennial, uh, technically speaking, uh, we do produce them and use them and grow them just as an annual. So uh, they're very tender. Uh, so unless you live in a really, really warm part of the world, um, you probably cannot grow them as a perennial. Uh, they're gonna die with, with the killing frost or with the first cold weather. A uh, Couple other facts about them is that uh, Every tomato is a little bit different. We're going to talk a lot about varieties and what that means um, in the next coming slide. Uh, but sometimes you can have somebody like a neighbor that says, oh, this is the best tomato. Make sure you grow it. Um, and then you try it and you think, eh, I'm disappointed. It wasn't as good for me. Uh, so, so just because it's the same variety doesn't always mean that you're going to get the same uh, results. Um, it does depend on uh, what type of soil you have. Um, and you know how the growing conditions are. So if the plant gets stressed, doesn't get enough water, doesn't have the right nutrients, uh, that can ultimately uh, determine and change the flavor a little bit. Uh, some other interesting things is that uh, the temperature that they like to grow in, it's right around 70 to 75 degrees. 
Uh, anything below 50 growth is going to stop. Um, and if it gets too hot, uh, it actually is not good for the, for the plant either. Uh, anything above 90 degrees through the day will make them abort their flowers, so you'll get less fruit. Um, and anything above 75 degrees at night uh, will also make them abort their fruit. Uh, so that can kind of be a problem. So just be, be forewarned of that. Uh, they also produce something called adventitious roots along the stem. So if you've ever had um, a tomato fall down to the ground and grow horizontally, you'll see little white things coming out of the stem, and that's just roots. Uh, so we have some pictures of that as we go along so folks can see what, that, what we're talking about. Um, but that's completely normal, and that's one great thing about the tomato itself is that anytime you get, if they get too tall before you, if you get too tall at transplants and they're, you know, you don't want to put them out, uh, you can always trench them and lay them down horizontal because any of those stems that are laying horizontal um, <clears throat> will actually turn to root and make your plant even stronger. Okay, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about their growth habits. Uh, we're going to see the terms determinant, indeterminate, and then also patio or bush and talk about what that means. So I just wanted to share, this is a photo of uh, my high tunnel again. When I first logged on, you can see this is later in the season. This was a couple years ago, uh, but tomatoes will grow and grow and grow if they're the indeterminate varieties. Uh, so most of these in the picture are uh, indeterminate, and that's the top of my high tunnel there, uh, which is about uh, nine feet. Uh, so they have reached the top a lot of years uh, in just a short amount of time. Again, we put them in around mid-May and by July they are already reaching the top. So it's pretty neat to see what the potential is for, for tomatoes. So we're going to hopefully uh, teach you guys this evening how you can get similar results um, in your own home garden. So what are the basics? What do tomatoes need? Uh, the first thing they need is they need a lot of sunshine. At least eight hours of direct sun uh, to get the most growth out of them as possible. So I'm not saying that you can't put them in an area that has six hours of sun, uh, but if you want the maximum amount of production possible, they have to have full sun. And the more sun, the better. Um, they also need well-drained soil, so they like a lot of water. Uh, we're going to talk about this again several times, but they need about an inch of natural rainfall a week. And what that boils down to is about six gallons per 100 square feet. Um, so we also tell people maybe six gallons per tomato plant, um, which seems like a lot of water, but let me tell you, they need it and they will take it up. And a lot of times when we talk about tomato gardening in a container, uh, the most limiting factor for most of those uh, situations is going to be water. Uh, so make sure that you feed your, your plants a lot of, a lot of water. Uh, and you can see this is a vigorous root system that tomatoes have. So they don't have a tap root. They have more of a fibrous root system, so they like to expand. And you need to think about that when you're putting them into a container uh, because the container doesn't necessarily need to be super, super deep. Um, it's more important that it's actually wide. Wide is better than deep uh, for these tomatoes. And those uh, root systems are pretty impressive, again, because if you think about if a tomato is actually a perennial, something that would want to come back year after year, it's got to have a massive root system, right? So if you have ever looked at a seed catalog or uh, searched the internet or maybe, you know, looked at some different tomato websites, you've probably seen the term determinate or indeterminate when referring to tomatoes. So I wanted to go over what that means. So if the term, if the tomato is a determinant variety, that means that it's going to set all of its fruit uh, within a four to six week period, uh, depending on the weather. Uh, so that means if you're interested in canning or preserving tomatoes, freezing them, um, determinants are a really good uh, variety for that because you're going to get a flush of fruit over a shorter period. Now, if you would rather have have a few fruits a little bit as you go along, then you want to look more at your indeterminate varieties. So these are going to be ones that begin to set fruit a little at a time. So you can see the bottom picture, they start to flower and fruit really early, and then they continue to do that all along the stem. And these are going to be the ones that, again, will continue to grow until they get a killing frost or until you prune them back. Uh, so 
I always tell master gardeners and other folks that are interesting, interested in growing tomatoes that maybe you want to do a combination of determinate and indeterminate. Yeah, you really have to kind of figure out what it is that, that you want out of your tomatoes. Um, most of the modern hybrids are going to fall on the determinant side, uh, whereas a lot of the older uh, heirloom varieties, a lot of your cherries, uh, and a lot of the larger fruited varieties that people tend to think of as a beefsteak variety are those ones that are going to cover an entire slice of of bread uh, for a tomato sandwich, um, those are going to be the ones that are going to be your indeterminate varieties. Okay, so just pay attention to that. A lot of times you'll also find this information on uh, this, the little tag if you go to a nursery or greenhouse and you purchase a transplant, uh, you'll find that information right on the tag. It'll tell you the, the name of the tomato and then if it's determinate or indeterminate or potentially a patio or bush variety, which would be really good for containers. So I did want to throw in a slide about container gardening because I know before the class I got several questions about can you grow tomatoes in a container? And the answer is yes. You can put almost anything in a container um, as long as you have the proper size uh, to help. So again, as I said, wider is going to be better than deeper. We tell folks that nothing smaller than a five gallon bucket for one tomato plant. Um, if you go much smaller than that, the root system really just cannot get what it needs and it's going to run out of water uh, way before the plant meets its needs. Okay. Uh, so five gallon buckets are not beautiful, they're not attractive, uh, but that's a great way to grow tomatoes. So think about that when you're, when you're picking out a container. Uh, nothing smaller than that. If you can get wider than a five gallon bucket, not quite as deep, that'll work too. And if you're going to you're probably going to want to do a mixture of soilless growing media. So either potting soil or something that, that you purchase from the store in a bag. Uh, you probably are not going to want to go out to your yard and, and dig up natural soil that you're going to find out there in your yard or garden. Uh, it, it's just not going to do very well. And remember, if you are converting an old container or something that's traditionally not a container like a basket or something like that, make sure that you do have good drainage, even a five gallon bucket. Uh, make sure that you do have some drainage holes in there. Um, some good varieties if you're looking for what you can put in a container would be some like again the bush, the dwarf, the patio names. I try to stick, stick with those. Uh, this was a fact sheet from um, Penn State uh, that I got these potential varieties from. It's hard to see on the screen, but if you click on, once you get the copy of the slides in the next few days as a PDF, uh, you'll be able to click on that link uh, for, for Penn State and you can visit this uh, fact sheet and, and learn more about container gardening and, and see some more information about these varieties to try in a container. So uh, next I wanted to talk about some terminology. So I found that uh, a lot of folks see these words and don't really know what they mean. Uh, so we're going to start with variety. We're going to talk about what an heirloom is, and then we're going to talk about what a hybrid is. So what is a variety? So any vegetable species can have a variety. It just means that it's a certain name or a certain type of plant. Um, so sometimes varieties are named because of where they came from, uh, maybe because of a certain color, shape, size, length of season, um, maybe even because they just have a particular feature about them. So I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a potato leaf brandywine tomato. Uh, but it's named that because the, the leaves on it look more like a potato rather than a tomato. Uh, they're actually rounded. Uh, so that's one way that, that people recognize it by its name. Uh, so these are just some examples of 2015 tomato varieties that I found uh, that I thought you guys might be interested in seeing. And a variety can be either open pollinated or a hybrid. So we're now going to talk about what the difference is between open pollinated and hybrid. So your open pollinated plants are not a hybrid. Uh, they come from seeds that are going to be have a relative 
area of fixed varietal characteristics. So that's a mouthful, uh, but it basically means that it doesn't matter what happens in nature. Uh, these open pollinated plants are pretty well fixed for what you're going to get. Now, that being said, if you take 10 different varieties and plant them all within a, a two foot space, you might get some cross pollination that's going to happen. But for the most part, if you're planting one variety or two of these open pollinated varieties in your garden, you can be pretty sure that they're going to breed true. So that means the seeds that you would save from these open pollinated varieties are going to look just like what the parent did. There's not a lot of, of difference in the characteristics from generation to generation. And that's because, you know, somebody along the way has selected for certain characteristics. So maybe for size, maybe for taste, uh, maybe for color, maybe for certain, you know, characteristics like they can take more heat or, or something like that. So open pollinated are what you're going to want to look for if you're planning to save seeds from season to season. Okay. The other option would be a hybrid. Okay, I'm sorry. We're going to go to an heirloom. Uh, so the term heirloom, again, I've seen this one uh, thrown around a lot on social media and, you know, in different magazines and things like that. And then basically an heirloom is just an open pollinated plant uh, that has a story or is really, really old. Uh, so usually to get the term heirloom associated with a variety, uh, it has to be at least 100 years old and we have to have some sort of history that goes with it. A lot of times these heirloom varieties will also have a cool story that goes along with it. Uh, so that's pretty fun. I sell a lot of tomatoes to uh, fresh markets, uh, like to farmers markets and things like that. So I know that my customers always enjoy uh, whenever there's a story that goes along with these varieties. So that's one reason that I've started growing a lot of heirlooms uh, lately is just because I like to talk about the history that goes along with it. So again, heirlooms are open pollinated plants. So all heirlooms are always going to be open pollinated, but open pollinated are not always going to be heirloom. Um, to get the heirloom designation on a plant, it has to be at least 100 years old and have a history of some sort that goes with it. Okay. So what's a hybrid? I see a lot of words on the screen here. Uh, but a hybrid uh, is something that is made on purpose. It's a cross between two parents uh, to get a specific outcome. Uh, so the, the cross that comes once you, you cross two parents together is going to be the, the F1, the first generation. Uh, I have a picture to show you what this means. And a lot of the really good things that come from a hybrid cross is that it has a hybrid vigor and it's a completely new plant. Uh, so therefore, a lot of times we can breed for, you know, more genetic variability. We can breed for uh, more disease resistance uh, and things like that that can really help us as gardeners. Um, so this picture is some of the work that was done by Gregor Mendel with peas on genetics uh, many, many, many years ago. Uh, but this picture is, is really good because it kind of helps simplify what it really means um, with the picture. So you can see the first line there, the P generation, these are the parents. And we know that with genotype and phenotype, so genotype is the gene expression, phenotype is the physical expression that we see uh, when we look at something. We can automatically see the, the phenotype just with our eyes, but a lot of times we don't know what the genotype is. So in this example, we have peas. Uh, so the first parent we have on the left is a round yellow pea, and we have crossed it with a wrinkled green pea. And the result is that we get this F1 generation, which the phenotype tells us that it's going to look just like the first parent. It's going to be a round yellow pea. The things we don't know are what the recessive genes are. Uh, so therefore, the recessive genes are what can kind of mess us up whenever we go and we cross two F1s together. So I'm not saying that you can't save seeds or anything like that from hybrids that crossed. Um, you're just going to have more variability. Uh, so you know, you can look at this um, 
the chart down here below, uh, the Punit square, and you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine out of 16 times, you are gonna get a P that's yellow, just like the parents in the first generation was. Uh, but then some of the other times, you're gonna get something completely different. You're gonna get some round green, you're gonna get some wrinkled yellow. So you're gonna start to see some new um, phenotypes coming out of these, these crosses, which can really be fun. Uh, but if you're hoping to, you know, <laughs> get a specific outcome, uh, it can kind of mess with things. So this is a little bit more intense than you probably need to know for um, tomato gardening. Uh, so we'll skip on over it. But uh, if you have questions about seed saving or things like that, we can talk about it after the class. But the goal is that you do want to save seeds from open pollinated or heirloom varieties. And I just want to just throw in a couple slides about companion planting. Some folks that are uh, used to gardening may find this interesting, but uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of um, people that have been out there playing around with gardening for a lot of years, and they found that there are some good chemical action reactions and things like that that come from planting certain plants close together. Sometimes you could use it as a trap crop to, to catch bad bugs that might infect your plants. Or sometimes you might get physical support or shade from the other plant that you plant nearby. Uh, so for tomatoes, I know for a fact that they love to be grown with basil. And I know that they also like to be grown with carrots. Uh, so that's two fun plants that you can mix in with your tomato gardening if you want to try something new. And this other chart was 10 companions. Um, and I've done, I've heard good things. Again, I've done the basil. I've heard good things about the borage. Uh, and I've done a lot of stuff with nasturtium and other plants. And of course, it's an age old, um, you know, theory that marigolds can help repel pests. So that shouldn't be too surprising for a lot of folks. So something new for you to try. So we're gonna move into what are some of the, the biggest problems and pests that we see. Uh, Miss Sherry, I'm gonna give you control of the screen and I'm gonna take over with the chat. So hopefully you'll have control now and you can move forward and talk about some of the pests. Okay, all right, thank you, Ashley. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the, we're gonna talk about some of the plant diseases and pests that cause some of the greatest issues that you may have as tomato gardeners. All right, let's see. And it's not going forward. Ashley, I'm not able to control it. I'm pushing the arrows. So can you forward it for me, please? So we're going to talk about some uh, cultural control um, things that you can do. So first of all, it's really important to keep a journal for gardening so that you can um, make note of different pest and disease issues that you have and, and which varieties of tomatoes you planted and, and what you had problems with, you know, which tomatoes had problems and which ones didn't. Um, so that can help you figure out what to do for the next season to head off problems ahead of time. So if you find that you have a particular disease problem, say fusarium wilt in your garden, then what you wanna do is the next year is you wanna try and find a tomato variety that is resistant to fusarium wilt, okay? Another thing that you can do is, and this holds true for any kind of vegetable gardening, you want to clean up uh, all of your uh, plant debris at the end of the growing season. And uh, you can compost it if you're gonna do a hot compost, which means you need to get that compost pile up to 140 degrees. That will kill uh, weed seeds and diseases. So if you're not going to hot compost, then diseased plant material should go in the trash, okay? So cleaning up diseased plant material or plant material that had a lot of uh, pests on it because it might contain eggs or uh, other stages of, of pest insects on it is a really important thing to do to help keep down your disease and plant, or excuse me, and uh, pest issues. Also, uh, while you're growing your tomatoes, if you notice that you have some kind of a disease issue on your plant, go ahead and prune it out right then, okay? Take that that uh, stem off, those leaves off, and put them in the trash, unless, once again, you're gonna hot compost. 
okay? Um, plant lots of flowering plants also to attract beneficial insects. That kind of goes along with the companion planting. Um, if you have a, a good variety of flowers and even herbs, uh, they will attract beneficial insects, which will then in turn help to control your pest insects. Okay, go ahead, Ashley, and forward me there. So uh, if you've looked in a, a catalog before to order your vegetable plants, you may have noticed these codes, um, that these codes represent the different diseases that are out there and then what that cultivar is resistant to. So if you're looking uh, up a tomato variety and you wanna make sure that it's resistant to nematodes, then in that catalog next to its name, look for an N. Now different catalogs may have different um, ways of doing this, but this is generally how they do it. And so look for these these little symbols next to the tomato variety that you're interested in to see if it is in fact resistant to these different diseases or um, nematodes. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, so first thing we're gonna talk about as far as diseases go is early blight. Now this is one that uh, I think just about everybody experiences it's pretty much ubiquitous. It's uh, everywhere in the environment. It is a fungus and uh, it is found in the soil. And this is what it looks like on your leaves. And it's very characteristic. Uh, once you become familiar with it, I think you will have an easy time of identifying it. So basically you have some brown uh, concentric circles, kind of looks like a, a bullseye and that will be surrounded by some yellowing. Eventually these disease uh, tissues will coalesce and it will kill the entire leaf. Okay, Ashley, go ahead and forward me there. So this is what the advanced symptoms of early blight look like. This is if you were to do nothing to try and arrest it. The disease begins at the bottom of the plant and moves its way up to the top and eventually um, the disease will kill your plants. Usually we don't see this happen though until near the end of the growing season, but something that you can do to help stop this without using any chemicals is as soon as you see those spots forming on your lower leaves, prune them off and throw them out. That will help to um, pr uh, delay the, the progress of this disease. Also, you can look at the actual fruit uh, on the right-hand side, give you an idea of what that looks like. And on the, the bottom corner there, you'll see the fruit has got some, uh, looks, we call that yellow shoulders. Um, and that's because the, the leaves have died. And so now those tomatoes, as they are ripening, are getting full sun on them. They're not shaded by leaves. And so that causes what we call the, the sh yellow shoulders. Go ahead, Ashley, and forward me. Okay, so early blight is um, caused by a fungus called Alternaria solani. And it also, as well as attacking tomatoes, it also attacks potatoes and eggplants. And it is in the soil. So when it rains or you water your plants, it splashes up the spores from this fungus onto the lower leaves of your plant. And that's where the disease uh, takes hold. And um, we already talked about what those lesions look like. It can spread rapidly with warm, humid weather, as is uh, the case for many diseases. Uh, increased humidity always encourages fungal growth. Okay, it does overwinter in crop debris and it can be found on wooden stakes and in your soil. So you may want to clean your stakes. Uh, another thing you can do to help prevent this disease is put down a layer of mulch on the soil that will help prevent the, the splashing up of these spores onto your plant. Okay, let's see. Go ahead, oh, there we go. Okay, so uh, for organic management, we, uh, we already talked about removing diseased plant tissue as soon as you see it. That's very helpful. 
increase your air circulation by not crowding your tomatoes. Uh, you can also trim off suckers. That will help to open up your plants. Don't worry, your tomato plants will do just fine if you remove some branches and, or leaves to help open up things into the center of the plant. Now, uh, different cultivars are gonna vary in success, susceptibility to this disease. So try, if you can, to find some cultivars that may be um, more resistant to this particular disease, to, to early blight. Also, some uh, fungicides that you can use that would be considered organic would be copper, um, but there aren't too many others that are very um, effective. And in fact, this is really considered a preventative, not curative. You can also use uh, chemical fungicides such as uh, mancozeb and chlorothalonil. Those are the chemical names that you will find in the product, either Mans8 or Dacanil 2787. There's many, there's other um, products out there that contain these chemicals, but the chemicals you wanna look for would be mancozeb or chlorothalonil. Okay, Ashley, let's see if we can go ahead. Okay, so we're gonna talk about septoria leaf spot. This is another one that I see from time to time happening in my garden and it, it's characterized by a lot of these little black dots on the leaves and then you get like a little yellow halo around those black dots and eventually um, it will, the leaf will turn brown and curl up and die. Okay, Ashley, move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so this shows um, some plants here that may have the disease. And I think we're just gonna go ahead to the next slide. So um, with this disease, uh, I mentioned, I mentioned uh, pruning out the suckers and this is a great um, photograph that shows you what a sucker is. So basically you have the main stem of the tomato plant and then you have a lateral branch coming out to the side. And then the sucker is that new branch that's, that starts to grow in that crotch between the, the main stem and the lateral branch. And you can cut those out and it will help to in increase air circulation in your plant. And also it will help um, the plant to uh, put more of its energy into other fruit and so that you get larger fruit instead of a lot of smaller fruit. So you get a better quality fruit if you uh, take out some of these these suckers. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Um, before we move on to that, I just want to say another thing about septoria leaf spot. Um, it, it does persist on your stakes and in the soil, uh, and it will kill a plant a lot faster than uh, early blight. So if you find you have a, a problem with septoria leaf spot, you'll want to make sure that you disinfect your stakes for the next year's growing season. So you can do that with a 10% bleach solution. And, <clears throat> excuse me, it should be soaked in that for at least 10 minutes. And then you can rinse it off, okay? Um, if you have a problem with the septoria <clears throat> for several, you know, excuse me, <clears throat> for a couple of seasons, you may, <clears throat> want to, oh, excuse me, I got a <clears throat> something in my throat. You may want to uh, actually rotate and move your tomatoes to a different location for at least a couple of years. And then that will also help to, um, you know, lessen that problem with septoria. <clears throat> okay, on this particular slide, we have a, a link to a great uh, video that was done by John Tronfeld on how to prune tomatoes. I encourage you to check that one out. <clears throat> You Sherry, could, do you need me to take over a minute? Yeah, well, you know what I really, really need is just to take a drink. So if I could okay. do Okay, yeah, you do that. Yeah. I could talk yeah. about these, these two links here for you real quick. Um, so as Sherry was saying, this first link is for a video on pruning tomatoes, uh, several questions about that uh, here prior to the class. So 
it's a great video that he did that talks about how to find the sucker on the plant and how to, to take that sucker out, uh, which is kind of funny when you say it like that, uh, but he does a nice job and shows you exactly how to do that. So if you're interested, again, this would be more important on your indeterminate varieties. Um, Suckering is not quite as important on your determinant, and you probably don't need to do it on your patio or bush varieties that you're going to have in uh, that are specific for containers. Uh, the next link down there at the bottom um, is on basket weaving or staking. So if you are growing in a tr traditional garden setting uh, and you don't want to do a stake on every single uh, plant, this tells you how to save uh, stakes and how to use uh, twine to weave in between. So I thought that was pretty fun. Uh, so that's uh, two options for you to try uh, if you want more information. Sherry, you okay? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Sorry about that. So um, somebody had a question about what chemicals you can use against septoria leaf spot. So I, I really just want to say that, you know, once you see the evidence of these diseases taking a hold on your plants, the chemicals that are out there available to homeowners generally are not curative. They are preventative, okay? So if you start to have a problem and you're seeing the evidence of that, these chemicals aren't necessarily, they're not necessarily gonna cure your plant. What they may help to do is keep it from spreading to some other um, branches on your plant or to other plants that are not diseased. So what you really need to do is, um, if you have a problem with diseases, is to begin applying fungicides at the beginning of the growing season and keep up with that through the entire growing season, okay? There are some chemicals out there that you can buy that producers will use that will actually um, help to arrest the disease, but these are very expensive and they are sold in bulk, okay? And they're not generally for um, home gardeners, okay? So just wanted to put that out there. All right, so the next disease that um, we're gonna talk about is late blight. Now this is one that thankfully, I don't think most people see very often. <clears throat> now we did have a bad outbreak in 2009, all up and down the East Coast. And um, this disease is very devastating. Once it's, um, contracted by your plant, your plant is going to die in two weeks. There's really a, not a whole lot you can do about it. This is a, a fungus and the spores are carried on the wind. Okay, it does not survive in your soil, at least not in the on the east coast where we live here. Okay, so you can look at this slide and see uh, some of the symptoms of this disease. It uh, causes these dark cankers on the stems and also these dark brown lesions on your leaves, which almost they'll turn dark brown and curl up, almost looks like uh, they've been burnt, okay? If you look at the fruit, it, in the very beginning, you'll have some water-soaked lesions that are olive colored, and then it will progress to looking pretty gnarly here if you look at that picture down on the, the lower left hand side of this picture. And uh, so you cannot eat those fruit, obviously. All right, Ashley, go ahead and forward me. Oh, okay, so the other thing um, with the late blight is that if you do uh, suspect that you have late blight, um, it's best to just remove those plants immediately and put them in a black garbage bag and let them sit out in the sun for at least a day so that it kills the plant and dispose of those plants you know, inside the trash bag and take it to the dump so that the spores don't spread to your neighbors, okay? All right, we're gonna move on to Fusarium wilt of, um, of tomatoes. And this is another disease that many gardeners see. It is a fungus that lives in the soil. And actually the symptoms uh, are, it looks like your plant is wilting, but it may recover in the evening, okay? And it is more of a, a whole entire plant looks like it's wilted. Also another symptom that you will see will be some 
yellowing of the leaves uh, near the bottom of the plant and the yellowing may occur on just one side of the plant or one side of the branch, okay, um, and may also cause some stunting. Now, it's um, this disease persists in the soil and there, you can't, you know, rid the soil of it, so you may need to move your tomatoes to a different location or choose to plant a fusarium wilt resistant variety, okay? Um, Eva purple ball is supposed to be one variety that is resistant to fusarium. And here are some more pictures of what that looks like, that disease looks like. You can see the yellow leaves near the bottom of the plant. It also creates brown streaking. Um, you can Sometimes you can see that on the outside of the stem, but if you were to peel back the um, outer skin, on the stems, you will see brown streaks and that will help you to um, identify this disease. Now keep in mind, uh, there are other things that can cause these kinds of symptoms, not just fusarium wilt, there are several kinds of wilts out there. Uh, also, of course, uh, if your plants don't have enough water, they're going to wilt and look droopy, okay? But one of the key things is that uh, look for this brown streaking and also if it seems like the whole plant wilts during the day and then recovers at night, this, these are some good clues that that's what the problem that you've got. Okay, go ahead and forward me there. Anthracnose is another fungal disease, but this is not something that you'll see till later in the season. You'll find it on your developing fruit for the most part. Um, you'll get these sunken lesions that can turn black and also the, it may produce spores that look kind of pinkish. So uh, you may want to pick your fruit early so you can avoid um, this problem. And we'll talk about the appropriate time to pick your fruit. Okay, go ahead and um, forward me there. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna move on to insects and mites. Uh, some effective organic insecticides include pyrethrins, neem extract, neem oil, and spinazad. Now, spinazad is a really interesting one. This uh, is derived from a bacteria that was discovered in a rum distillery in the Caribbean. And it can control a lot of different kinds of insects. Um, it is through being ingest, ingested. So it can control beetles and caterpillars, flies and thrips, and I find it to be pretty effective. And, okay, go ahead and forward me there. Okay, in addition, we've got Bt, which is Bacillus thuringiensis, and this controls caterpillars, um, young caterpillars. I mean, once the caterpillars get uh, pretty far along, Bt no longer is very effective on them. So you, you do need to use it uh, early. So be monitoring your plants to see if you uh, have any of these caterpillars. You can first look, you can look to see if there's like little holes or what we call window painting where the, the, the leaf looks real thin. Um, you can almost see light through it because something's been chewing on it. Okay, so that's another reason to monitor your plants frequently. And Bt is, um, is also a bacteria, and uh, it, it doesn't persist in the environment very long. It gets uh, broken down by uh, UV light, and also rain can, can wash it off your plants. Surround is another great one. Now, this is, uh, that is the brand name. It's kaolin clay, and it, it's used to control aphids, mites, caterpillars. It, it can suppress bugs. It's uh, great for um, eggplant and uh, suppressing flea beetles. And I think we talk about that a little bit later, but what it does is it actually, it dries out the insects because it's, um, it scratches up their exoskeleton so that then the moisture from inside their bodies uh, escapes and it dries them out that way. In the case of flea beetles, it actually, it bothers them so much, they're trying to get it all off of their bodies and they're just so distracted with it, they, they stop chewing on your plants. So that's pretty neat. All right, hort oil. 
um, that can control your soft-bodied insect pests like aphids, mites, um, and anything that's kind of immature and still has a soft body, white flies too. Okay, and it, it, it works that way by basically suffocating the insect. So you have to get good coverage on the insect in order for horticultural oil to work. So it works by contact. Uh, insects breathe through their bodies um, through holes called spiracles. So the oil covers that and they can't breathe. Okay, insecticidal soaps also can help suppress aphids, mites, and other soft-bodied uh, insects or immature insects. All right, Ashley, go ahead. Okay, so this is a picture of aphids. Uh, on, you'll see they're on the front side of the leaf and the back side of the leaf. You might see a lot of, might be a lot of white stuff on there. It could be the, the shed skins of the aphids as they molt and go from one stage to the next. Also, um, if you looked real close, you might see some, what it looks like, some brown balls, real tiny, the size of an aphid. And we would call those mummified aphids. And that is an indication that you have some beneficial insects here helping you out. You have some um, wasps, parasitic wasps, that are attacking the aphids and killing them. So that's an interesting story there. but. Um, I think we'll move on to the next slide in the interest of time. Okay, so besides parasitic wasps, there are many other beneficial insects to, to encourage. Please don't kill them. Please help them along. Don't spray them with insecticides. And another one of these would be um, lady beetles, okay? Lady beetles, adults, and larvae eat many, many uh, aphids and other soft-bodied insects like scale, and they might eat mites and um, white flies, okay? So you want to encourage them, and that lady be ladybird beetle is eating aphids on the underside of that leaf. Okay, go ahead and forward me there. Okay, now this is an interesting one here, tobacco hornworm. Um, you see the adult over here on the left hand side is a moth. So this is the caterpillar of the, the hornworm moth. And boy, if you take a look at that caterpillar, anybody ever find one of them in their garden? It can be kind of scary. They're like huge, okay? But, and they can make uh, a disaster area out of your tomato patch in quick order, okay? You know, one of them can devour your plant in a few days. So. Be on the lookout for these guys. Um, they are kind of pretty, but they can do a lot of damage. Um, so you'll see some of the damage there in those tomatoes. And then on the lower left-hand corner, that, that is actually the, the pupil case or cocoon of the, um, the hornworm. Okay, Ashley, next one. So here we have a picture of a parasitized tomato hornworm. Uh, so this is evidence of some more um, beneficial insects at work, another kind of parasitic wasp, a braconid wasp. And what those, this little tiny little wasp does is it uses its ovipositor to insert eggs inside of a tomato hornworm, the larva. And those um, those eggs hatch inside of the worm and they begin to eat the worm from the inside out. Now, meanwhile, while they're eating, they're putting out these hormones that actually tell the tomato hornworm to keep on eating. Okay, so, so that way they've got a free meal ticket and they are developing inside of this hornworm as it continues to eat your tomato plant. And you really have no idea what's going on until you see all these little white um, pupil egg cases on the outside of the tomato hornworm. So what's happened there is um, as the eggs have hatched and the larvae come out and are, are eating inside of the tomato hornworm, when they're ready to go to the next stage, which would be the cocoon stage, they burrow out of the worm and then they spin this little cocoon and they finish their development inside of that cocoon. And then the wasp will cut a little hole at the end of each of you know of their cocoon and come out as an adult wasp. 
So that's how that works. And once that happens, then the tomato hornworm is done for, okay? Um, it's, it's not gonna survive that. But if you do see this, uh, you see the, the pupil A cases on the, the hornworm, I would leave it alone. Um, that way you are helping to propagate these uh, wasps that do help keep this worm under control. Okay. All right, another insect pest you may have to deal with would be brown and green stink bugs, which are native to North America. Um, they do cause some damage to your fruit and to other vegetable plants. They are true bugs, so they have piercing, sucking mouth parts. So uh, they get on your fruit and they insert their proboscis and they suck out the plant juices. And the, the damage looks like this in the picture. You see these lighter colored blotches on your, your tomatoes. They might be kind of circular in origin. They can coalesce into larger areas. Um, if you look inside of each of those little lighter areas, you might see a little brown dot, and that's where the insect um, stuck his proboscis in to uh, suck out the plant juices. And um, it can be a means to introducing diseases to your, to your tomatoes, okay? So, you know, they can be a problem. But uh, it doesn't mean you can't eat this fruit. I mean, looking at it, it's okay. Even this is kind of like a cosmetic injury, but it can advance into um, a bigger problem because it has allowed for diseases to, to get in. Okay, Ashley, you wanna forward me there? Now, another, mom, or another stink bug that you may do battle with in your garden is the brown marmorated stink bug, which is uh, a non-native introduced species. And it, it, it's come to us from Asia and it does uh, prey on many different kinds of vegetables and fruits. And you can see the adult in the left-hand corner and one of the characteristic markings of a brown marmorated stink bug are the white bands on the antenna. And they will um, cause similar damage as the brown and green stink bugs. And they're a little harder to, to control. You could use permethrin on stink bugs to help control those insects. Okay, and then we have this gruesome photo of a um, praying mantis lopping the head off of this stink bug. So I guess part of this is like, yay, and the other part is like, oh that my, that's just too gross. But. Uh, Praying mantises are neat. Um, they are opp opportunistic feeders, not necessarily eating just bad insects. They eat anything they can catch, um, but they are pretty cool to have in your garden. And you can see this picture on the right-hand side of this post just covered with brown marmorated stink bugs. Now, they're not that bad in um, uh, Garrett County, Maryland at this time. But I know in central Maryland, uh, they were really bad, just, I mean, covering sides of houses and things. I think some of that may have kind of equal or got a little bit of equilibrium there and it's not quite as bad, but they, they, uh, they are a problem. Go ahead, Ashley. Okay, so this is what I had mentioned earlier about kaolin, kaolin clay. Uh, or surround, which is the brand name, being great for working on uh, eggplants, that you cover your leaves with the kaolin clay and it really discourages the flea beetles, which you see in the upper left-hand corner. Go ahead, uh, Ashley. Okay, so um, it's, it's, not, it's pretty inexpensive um, and you can, you spray the leaves with a mixture of one cup of this kale and clay to one quart of water. So you wanna apply it thoroughly to all your leaf surfaces and you wanna maintain that white film coating on the leaves. Um, it might take a couple of applications to do that. And if it rains, you're gonna to have to reapply. Um, you can use that up, up until the, the day of harvest of your fruits and vegetables. So um, this is a great product. Go ahead, Ashley. Okay, so this is something else you might see on your tomatoes. Uh, sometimes you might see these, um, these dry holes in your tomatoes. This is something um, that has been caused by some kind of caterpillar or maybe a cutworm has started to, to feed on your tomato, but it stopped for some reason and then the tomato 
healed that wound over and it's perfectly fine to eat. Go ahead, Ashley. This is a climbing cutworm. Okay, so cutworms can be a real problem on your tomatoes. They will uh, just eat your tomatoes from the inside out. So they, and they usually enter it from the, the stem end. Go ahead, Ashley. Um, tomato pinworm is another one that you may see. And this is the larva of this uh, moth that you see at the bottom of your screen. They uh, will you know, mine on the leaves. If you look on that picture in the left-hand corner, and that's caused by feeding that happens between the, the layers of the leaf. And they also will enter into your tomatoes and they will eat that fruit. And you can use spinazad to help control them. That's a good one for that. Now spider mites are another problem that you may have with your, your tomatoes, especially if they are located in hot, hot and dry areas or climates. Um, we see a lot of problem with that in high tunnels and greenhouses because they tend to be very hot and dry. Now what that damage looks like is little tiny white pin hole or spots, little tiny spots speckling on your leaves. It could be white or it could be yellow. And it's caused by a spider mite, which are really tiny. Most of them um, or many of them are hard to see with the naked eye. And, but they are not insects, okay? They are related to spiders. They have eight legs. And they actually suck the chlorophyll out of the leaves, leaving behind these white or yellow spots. Um, you can check the underside of your leaves to see if you find these little white uh, castings uh, that they have shed as they've molted and gone from one developmental stage to the next. Um, they are difficult to control. You can use um, water to kind of wet the plants down, kind of maybe blast them off, make it a more humid environment so it's less welcoming to them. There are some heavy duty chemicals out there that can control spider mites, but I'm not sure about on plants that you're gonna eat from. I know they're, they're, they're for um, ornamental plants, but anyway, I, I wouldn't suggest using those. So you, you're gonna have to rely on other methods. Uh, you can use horticultural oil, but make sure you cover the plants well um, to, for that to be effective. And it's only gonna suppress them. You're probably gonna have to, to re reapply. Um, let's see. Yeah, and they have many generations per year. Also something I forgot to mention, besides the white castings on the underside of leaves, you can look for, for webbing. That would also be, you know, like spider webs, that would also be an indication that you have spider mites. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Okay, um, so we already talked about most of this. Um, and one other thing to add is don't fertilize your plants too much. Excessive growth uh, encourages pest insects and spider mites. And someone earlier in the presentation asked a question about why they weren't getting fruit on their tomatoes. So over, -fertiliz over fertilization can actually um, keep you from getting fruit because it encourages the plant to put out a lot of vegetative growth and not too much fruit. Okay, so don't over fertilize. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. So some more integrated pest management tips. That's what IPM stands for. Um, and I mentioned earlier to help head off some of these issues and to make sure that you get some nice fruit that you can eat, pick your fruit as soon as they start to turn pink or we call it the breaker stage. When the color starts to change on the underneath side of the tomato, um, you can look, turn it over and look and if the color is starting to change, you can actually pick and take indoors. Okay, and the fruit will continue to ripen indoors. So you're not gonna miss out on flavor or anything else. But by doing that, you are helping to head off any problems that you might have with uh, pests or diseases by picking the tomatoes at that stage. Okay, go ahead, Ashley. Okay. 
Let's see, some other things. Um, I mentioned this earlier also, wilt doesn't necessarily mean that you have a disease. It could just be that your plants need to be watered. And there are several different kinds of wilts. Some are caused by fungi and some are caused by bacteria. Okay, don't get all excited and think that you're gonna get late blight every year. It really, um, just keep an eye out for it. Uh, but I really haven't seen it very often here where I live, okay? And um, disease resistance between plants is going to, to vary. And another question that we often get is, okay, so if I have this disease issue, should I plant this plant in the same spot? And I would say for um, early blight, it's pretty much everywhere. I don't think you're gonna get away from that. So, but for other diseases, yeah, I would, I think I would move it to another spot, okay, because a lot of them are soil-borne diseases, and um, you can avoid it by, by moving it, or you can put your, your plants in pots and, and avoid the issue of contaminated soil that way. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Ashley. All right, thanks, Sherry. Um, there's just a couple questions that just came in. Uh, one about coffee grounds that I didn't get to answer. Uh, are coffee grounds good or bad for tomatoes? I think it's everything in moderation. Sherry, you can jump in if you don't know, if you don't agree. Um, coffee grounds are great to add to compost, but I wouldn't just add them right to tomatoes directly, but they are a good addition to your compost pile. Best time to water tomatoes and plants. Um, you definitely want to water in the morning if at all possible. Uh, that helps to let uh, the plant take up as much water as it needs throughout the day and helps to let mother nature the water to dry off the leaves so that you don't have uh, all that moisture going into the evening where fungal spores can land on your plants and grow um, you know more more readily so water in the morning um, water again is the most limiting factor in a lot of these uh, containers and as well as a lot of gardens um, so be sure that you do water again each tomato a plant probably needs five gallons, five to six gallons of water a week. Um, so they need a lot of water, okay? Okay, so Sherry, I don't know if you wanna pick back up. There's several coming in all of a sudden there. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and start talking about uh, abiotic problems. So abiotic problems would be those things that are non-living that we see. So not fungus, not pests, not diseases like that. This is more things from the uh, problems that we see because of stress in the environment or things that maybe we're not doing quite right in our garden. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to share with you would be uh, frost damage. Uh, so we just had 32 degrees. Some people had 25 degrees here um, Sunday evening. So if you had your plants out, they might have gotten frosted. Um, if nothing else, you could end up with these um, like shiny white bronzish, bron bronzish uh, looking leaves on your plants. Uh, that is an indication that it's been too cold for your plants. So check that out. Um, it can also be uh, like brown splotches uh, here on the left hand side that you see. Uh, sometimes if there was water on the plant and it froze, it can uh, lead to something like that. Um, and the bottom one that we see is kind of hard to, to tell in this picture, but anytime you see purple, purple modeling or purple veining on, uh, on your leaves, uh, that's a good indication that it's a phosphorus deficiency. So phosphorus is the second number in your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium in your fertilizer analysis. And a lot of times it's not that there's not phosphorus available uh, in your soil. It's usually because uh, the soil microbes in the soil are still too cold to convert that phosphorus into a form uh, that the plants can take up. So a lot of times you don't have to do anything um, as long as the soil is on its way to warming up. Uh, you can always give them a little shot of you know, a water soluble fertilizer, like um, I shouldn't mention certain brands, but things like miracle Grow, something that you can mix in a watering can uh, and give them a little boost of, of a nutrient that's readily available to them. Um, edema is another one that we see. Uh, sometimes it's linked to some of the other diseases that Sherry uh, talked about. Sometimes it's just because there's too much moisture. Uh, it's gonna look kind of like a puddle of yuck. <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, uh, but it kind of looks just 
like it's just mushy and if you were to touch it it would just feel like slime um, so just be careful uh, you don't want your plants to sit in water. I know I've talked a lot about the plants needing a lot of water this um, this presentation, but you don't want them to be sop and wet all the time. You do want them to dry out. Um, so once they dry out, just stick your finger in there. If it's dry, that's when it's time to water. If you can still feel some moisture, maybe wait a day uh, and then give them some water. Uh, this is a really big problem that we hear a lot about, um, blossom drop, uh, and this is due to environmental stress. Uh, you can see, you know, people are always really excited about getting their first, whether it's their first zucchini or their first cucumber or their first tomato. Uh, and as gardeners, we tend to study our plants early in the season, I think a little more than later. Uh, so if you happen to be monitoring your plants and you see the um, plant aborting its flowers for some reason, that's a good indication that something's, you know, wrong environmentally with the plant. Uh, so this would probably be a good example of it being too hot. We talked about this at the beginning of the class. Uh, anything above 75 degrees at night uh, for more than one or two nights uh, can make the plant uh, drop its blossoms or being above 90 degrees throughout the day uh, can cause environmental stress on a tomato. I threw these two slides in here um, just because we do get some questions about herbicide injury. Now, oftentimes this is not the case on most things that we see. Uh, if you see the bending, twisting type of growth, a lot of times it's actually caused by aphids uh, and not by herbicide injury. But if you do have, um, if you have your garden next to, you know, power lines that potentially could have uh, herbicide applications or if you have yard treated with like a weed and feed product or something like that there's always the the possibility that you could be getting some drift or some um, some runoff so just think about that the growth would be completely twisted sometimes a different color you know different shape um, not always the case uh, but something to consider uh, this is another big one that we get a lot um, and a lot of people say the answer to blossom end rot is to put Epsom salt on. Uh, that is definitely not the case. Uh, so blossom end rot is not, uh, you know, a biotic disease. It's not caused by an insect. It's actually caused by not enough calcium and it's not that there's not enough calcium in the soil. It's often that there's not enough calcium in the plant available. So there's usually not enough water to move the calcium up from the soil or uh, move it throughout the plant. So the plant will start stealing calcium from, you know, usually the oldest uh, tomatoes on the vine. Uh, that's where you're going to start to see it so that it, uh, the plant has enough calcium to, to make new tomatoes. So you oftentimes these tomatoes will not ripen. Uh, they will not be any good. If you start to see this, again, you need to increase the amount of water that you're giving your plants. Um, and you might as well go ahead and pull off any any of your tomatoes that have the blossom end rot uh, because there's no cure for those ones that are already infected. So pull those off. This is one called cat facing. So hopefully you get a chuckle out of this picture, uh, the cute little cat up in the corner. Uh, but cat facing is actually a problem with pollination of the, of the tomatoes. Again, at the beginning, I said that tomatoes are self-pollinating. So usually as long as there's some wind or some rain, uh, that's all the plants really need to get good pollination. But um, if we have several days of you know, rainy weather all in a row, sometimes the flowers aren't gonna be able to open correctly um, and they'll stick together. Or if it's too cold, um, sometimes you'll see this. Again, um, the recommendation from the Home and Garden Information Center is that you can pull those tomatoes off. Um, I've left them grow at times. It just depends. Sometimes they will go ahead and grow out of it to some extent and you can still harvest them, but they're just not going to be as pretty. But definitely if you have a picture of a tomato, like the situation on the top left, um, I wouldn't pull that off. It's a, it's a big tomato and it's not going to hurt it. It'll continue to ripen. You can just cut that, cut that spot out. Uh, we talked at the beginning also about these adventitious or aerial roots. So again, anytime your tomato stem falls over and grows horizontally, this is what's happening. Um, that's just the beauty of a tomato. Anything that grows horizontal wants to turn into root. Uh, so again, if you have really tall transplants uh, that you get, you get to the, the nursery too late in the season and all that's left are tall ones, just make a trench, lay those stems down horizontally and you'll get all that area turning into root and you'll get really strong, really strong um, 
tomato plants. Uh, this is one that I see in my high tunnel a lot. Uh, this is heat stress, uh, but it's physiological leaf roll. Again, you would determine that this is the problem once you went through all the other things that it potentially could be, like aphids and spider mites and uh, things like that. Uh, it will not kill the plant. Uh, it will make it a little less productive. Uh, but once you start seeing this, um, you need to either move your containers or try to figure a way to get the plant a little bit cooler uh, if possible. Uh, make sure that you do water it a little bit more too because if this plant is uh, stressed out and causes having these leaf rolls, um, that's not a good sign for it. Concentric cracking and radial cracking. A lot of times we'll see this after a big rainstorm uh, where wind or, um, you know, has pushed part of the skin in as the, the fruit is developing. Um, again, a lot of times you're not going to probably want to eat these fruits. Um, if it's extreme, like the ones on the top left, <clears throat> in the top right. Uh, you won't want to eat those, um, but they're not going to hurt you by any stretch of the imagination. They're just not going to be as pretty. We have something called gray wall on the top right. Uh, this is when the inside of the fruit just doesn't seem to ripen correctly. Usually this happens in the fall of the year when we start to lose day length and it gets a little too cool or low light conditions. Uh, sometimes if it's internally with pithiness, like you see in the bottom, uh, bottom right hand side, uh, that can be caused by too high temperatures or not enough potassium. Um, there are some varieties, a lot of heirloom varieties, especially beefsteak varieties that just tend to be a little more prone to this. Uh, so if you have issues like this year after year, you might want to consider trying a different variety, maybe a smaller a variety that's going to mature a little bit quicker and not need quite as much uh, potassium. Uh, green shoulders, we talked about this at the beginning. Uh, usually it happens when something happens to the leaf canopy, uh, too much exposure to sun. So uh, like Sherry was talking about with either early blight or you know one of those other diseases, if the canopy of the, the plant is reduced for some reason, um, you might end up getting this damage on the, on the fruit. So another reason that you do want to make sure that you are, you know, pruning your tomatoes or suckering your tomatoes, but you do want to make sure that you do have a large amount of, of leaf canopy left. Uneven ripening on the right hand side, top corner, um, low light, cloudy weather. Again, usually we see this in the, the fall of the year. I've always been told that if you look at the bottom of your tomato, if you see like a white star uh, where the blossom was, if it turn, if it's white, then you can go ahead and take it in and it will continue to ripen. Uh, the one on the bottom right is zipperine. Again, that's usually a problem by, um, that has to do with fertilization. Um, so the anthers, the part of the flower, um, is sticking together. You can eat it, just cut it out. Um, you know, it usually doesn't go deeper than the skin, uh, so it's not usually a huge problem. All right, I have just two polling questions. We are not quite done. We want to do a few more things. Uh, I wanted to throw up these polling questions for those folks that are still with us. Uh, give us a quick, some quick feedback um, after the polling questions are over. I am going to go into some information about uh, heirloom varieties. So if you're interested in uh, growing heirlooms, you might want to stick around for that. Um, and then we will have some other resources at the end. So uh, let me throw these polling questions up here for you. If you would go ahead and um, just answer those for us. Give us a little bit of feedback. Give folks just a couple more minutes. Thank you all so far. We have 260 folks that have that have answered so far. Thank you. All right. Still a few folks entering. All right, 
I'm going to go ahead and end the polling question. Thank you all for your participation. We do, uh, we always appreciate uh, the, the feedback that we get from everyone. Um, I'll end the polling, share the results. It looks like a lot of folks do think that um, they're increasing some gardening skills and will hopefully increase the amount of tomatoes. So thanks for that. Um, we are going to move on into some heirloom varieties. Um, as I said earlier uh, in the presentation, uh, we I started growing heirlooms probably, I don't know, six years ago for my fresh market, uh, farmer's market clients. And one of my very favorite um, heirlooms that I've found so far is something called uh, a mortgage lifter. So again, it's an heirloom, it's at least 100 years old. Um, and it actually came from West Virginia. I grew up in West Virginia, uh, even though I work for uh, Maryland Extension. Um, but this is one that has a really cool story uh, that my folks always get excited about. And the story is that uh, this um, MC Biles from Logan, West Virginia, uh, he started uh, propagating these mortgage lifters and he ended up selling the plants for $1 each in the 1940s. Uh, and he paid off his $6,000 mortgage on his house with them. So that's how they got their name. Uh, so these are, again, one of my favorites. We love them. They're a pinkish tomato. They get really big. They're, you know, if you want something that's gonna go on a tomato sandwich, um, that's what we hear a lot of people uh, talking about. Um, it's one of the, the best ones that I've found. Um, and they're available, you know, widely these seeds are on, you know, lots of different totally tomatoes and, um, you know, Seed Saver Exchange and a lot of those different sites if you're looking for these seeds. Um, the next one we tried a few years ago, this was something called a Zwicka, um, and it's actually a Russian heirloom, and it was interesting because it was actually kind of citrusy tasting. Um, people, uh, they didn't go crazy about it. Uh, my brother was excited about trying it because it was a Russian heirloom, um, and it didn't get to be huge. It was kind of a three inch, 10 to 16 ounce a smaller tomato, which is nice because not everybody wants a huge tomato. Um, so if you're looking for something different, it has a little bit of a, like I said, a citrusy sweet taste to it. Um, my dad wasn't a big fan of it, um, but um, something to try. Uh, Golden Jubilee, this was, again, it's one, the one that was introduced in 1943 a really, really nice yellow tomato. It's not orange, it's truly yellow. Um, and it's it's just a really, really good one uh, to try if you're looking for a nice yellow tomato. They'll get uh, not huge, probably, they're probably about a, a 10 ounce, 12 ounce tomato, uh, not humongous, but um, something to try. Uh, this is one that's from my local community where I grew up. Uh, this is Homer Fike's yellow ox heart. Uh, so if anybody's familiar with ox heart, there's pink, there's red, uh, there's this, this yellow one, lots and lots of varieties of ox hearts. Um, and they're said to be shaped kind of like a cow's heart. Uh, so uh, kind of big at the top and small at the center. Uh, this one is huge. I've never seen a tomato this big. Uh, it, it was probably... I've had them probably four inches wide. Uh, they were just humongous, uh, humongous plants. So one to try if you're interested in a yellow tomato. Again, a lot of ox hearts do have a hard center. Uh, so there's gonna be some waste to any of your ox heart varieties. Uh, Brandywine pink, this is another really good, um, if you're looking for a nice slicing tomato, uh, we even do a lot of canning with it. Uh, and this is one that has potato leaf varieties or potato leaf foliage. Uh, and a lot of, um, you know, a lot of chefs tend to like this one. Uh, really fun one to try in your vegetable gardening. Again, as we talked about before, heirlooms tend to have you know, a little bit less disease resistance. Uh, so you need to be forewarned that you, know, you might have a little bit more problems with some of the, the fungal diseases and things like that. Mr. Stripey, this is one of my absolute favorite tomatoes. Uh, the first time I grew this was outside in my mom's garden. And I'll never forget when I went out there to harvest it and I had one uh, almost twice the size of my fist and I thought, this is the tomato for me. Um, and it gets this beautiful uh, red blush to it whenever it's ripe. Uh, it's usually a yellowish orange um, and then it gets this, this nice red stripe through the center so it's really a pretty thing to, to slice and have on plates. Yellow pear, you're looking for what you can save seeds from. This is awesome. It's an indeterminate. The vines can go more than eight feet tall. Um, really, really easy one to save seeds from year after year. 
just wonderful for, you know, kids if they like cherry tomatoes or something like that. Rutgers is an old time favorite. You can find seeds for Rutgers at every dollar store uh, across the country, even Dollar Tree, uh, but it is an heirloom and uh, it is actually resistant to a lot of diseases like verticillium, fusarium, and even some canker disease. Uh, these were two that, the last two are kind of odd ones. Um, I'm not even going to try to say this one, but it's named after a river in Mississippi, I believe, uh, or Missouri maybe. Um, but it says this one is actually, uh, it has like a peach fuzzy skin to it. Uh, we had a master gardener from Allegheny County uh, where Sherry is, we did a taste test on heirloom tomatoes several years ago and we had um, a master gardener bring one of these and I was completely blown away by it. So it takes something to get used to, but it does have a fuzzy skin, uh, not something that you uh, definitely want to, you want to be prepared for it, but you'll definitely throw uh, your friends and neighbors uh, for a loop if you, if you grow this one. And the last one I have for you uh, is a green zebra. So this is one that stays green when it's ripe. Uh, green tomatoes are not everybody's cup of tea, uh, but they definitely are tangy. They do remind me of, you know, eating a normal green tomato, but a little bit sweeter than that. Um, but they're beautiful. This would be a smaller variety, just a little bit larger than um, like a larger than a cherry tomato, but smaller than like a salad tomato. So if you're looking for something like that, uh, try the green zebras. I did stick some resources in here for you. Uh, Maryland Vegetables uh, by Jerry Brust. He has some great information on there. Uh, the Home and Garden Information Center with University of Maryland Extension. Uh, they have great YouTube videos. They have over 100 on their website if you're interested in any topic. Uh, you can search by vegetable, by fruit, uh, by diseases, whatever, you know, whatever you're looking for. They make it really easy. You can follow that link uh, there at the bottom. Uh, Sherry and I are hosting, uh, let's see, five more uh, online uh, Zoom trainings in the next uh, few weeks. So I did throw this up here if you're if you're curious or would like to join us, we will be doing tea gardening uh, next Tuesday. Uh, Miss Sherry will be sharing with us all the different plants and the history of teas. So that's gonna be a lot of fun. And the very last thing that you'll have is some information on grafting tomatoes uh, for your information. Uh, again, we will be sending out the slides to everyone who logged in uh, today for the presentation. Even if you were just on for a couple of minutes, uh, we will be sure uh, to send you a copy of the slides and a link to the recording uh, as long as it came out okay. So with that, I do thank everyone for sticking around. We are gonna uh, see if we had any questions that we wanted to uh, follow up with. Sherry, do you have any questions you want to talk about or how do you want to go about this? Um, okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, I was trying to keep up. I had one question I just saw of what was a, a low acid heirloom variety. I think uh, Whipsicon and Peach is a low acid variety. Do you have any? Yeah. Brandy wine, they're low acid because they're pink, pink brandy wine pink ox heart, uh, any of the pink ones or yellow ones will be low acid. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm getting a lot of questions about eggshells, adding that. Um, over time, the eggshells will decompose and release calcium into the soil, which is great because your tomatoes need calcium uh, to do well. Um, however, I think the amount of time that it takes for it to break down, you may not see the results of that during the current growing season. And I think a lot of the reason why a lot of people ask that because they are aware that a calcium deficiency can cause blossom end rot in their tomatoes. And while this is true, the issue behind that is actually infrequent or uh, infrequent watering. So if you don't have consistent watering, the water is not moving the calcium from the soil up to your uh, tomato fruit that is developing and that's when you'll get blossom end rot. So it's more of a uh, water availability issue than it is actually a lack of calcium in your soil. So just be aware of that. It's, it's always good, you know, it's good to add calcium, that's great. Um, but the bigger issue for preventing uh, blossom end rot is making sure that you have consistent watering.
All right, do you see any other things on here, Ashley? No, I haven't been able to keep up too well. Um, so I don't think I see a whole lot of anything. Uh, somebody says to add lime to the hole prior to planting. Um, You're afraid that could burn the roots a little bit. Yeah, you, we recommend a soil test before you add any type of lime. Um, lime is more for just pH, you know, for trying to get your pH around six and a half. Uh, that's where tomatoes are going to thrive. So too much lime, they're not going to be happy. They like it, you know, right around the mid, mid range. Um, so be careful with that. I had a question about um, seven dust. Uh, so seven, uh, I just read today that it's been reformulated some, but uh, in the past, we've not always recommended seven just because it's very um, broad spectrum. So it kills, I think, seven different families of insects. So uh, if you can be a little more specific to target whatever pest you're really trying to to kill, uh, it's a little bit better for the environment and it's a little bit better for the, the beneficial insects that, that you don't want to kill um, accidentally. And seven also has a really uh, long, at least the old formulations of seven, I haven't seen anything new, um, but the old formulations have a long pre-harvest interval. So um, like on leafy greens, if you would put seven dust on there, you have to wait at least 21 days before you can harvest them safely. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a long time and you don't want to forget that kind of thing. So um, just oh. something to think about. Um, I've had several questions about what's the right size container and it really needs to be a five gallon pot or larger. Um, I mean, you can grow a tomato in a three gallon pot, but I just don't think it's going to do as well uh, as in a five gallon or larger. Um, right. Let's see. Someone I'm seeing a lot about seed saving. Do you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You talk about that. Okay, so seed saving from tomatoes, uh, we usually recommend that you do it in a, in a wet environment or through fermentation. So again, you don't wanna be saving seeds from anything that's not an heirloom or open pollinated uh, variety. So uh, once you figure out which varieties that would be in your garden, uh, you can actually just take them put and take the tomato. Uh, you'll want to squish all the guts out for lack of a better word. Uh, that's the part that has the, the tomato seeds in it. Put it in a, a jar or a cup with some water and let it ferment for about five days. It's going to be gross and disgusting, but um, the fermentation actually helps to take the the slimy layer off of the seed and it's going to help increase your your germination whenever you do decide to grow them the following season. I always just lay them out after the the fermentation period is over the five days. You can rinse them off, use a strainer, and then I lay them out on a paper towel and let them dry. Um, and then I store them either in a, a paper envelope um, or something like that so that all the water can't Make sure that there's no absolutely no water left in the seeds um, and you can save them till you're you're ready to plant. And if you want more information about that, we'll hopefully be doing a class on seed saving towards the fall um, if we do continue uh, these online classes. Okay, some other questions. There's a lot of questions about like, you know, how often to water and how to fertilize. So I just want to say as far as the watering goes, don't water on a schedule, okay? what you should be doing is checking your soil to see if it's moist or not. Um, you can stick your finger down into the soil, uh, you know, up to your first, second knuckle. If it's, if it's dry, you definitely need to, to water. If you're in, you have your plants in pots, you definitely are going to, you know, unless it rains that day, you're going to need to water way more frequently than you do for plants in the ground. So generally, if it's a sunny day, I have to water a tomato that's in a pot every day. Um, but, you know, don't be thinking schedule, be thinking, you know, is my soil moist or, or is it, you know, dry or is it too wet? Check it, check that out. Um, right. There's no easier way than to stick your finger in there. If, if, if you don't feel any moisture or you feel very little moisture, I would say go ahead and water it. Yeah. As far as fertilizing goes, I mean, different people have different ideas about how to do that. If I'm going to grow a tomato in a pot, I mix in some slow release fertilizer uh, in the potting mix according to the directions on the container. And that will feed the plants, uh, you know, slowly over three, four, five months, depends on what kind you get. 
And then um, if you're not opposed to using chemical fertilizers, you can use miracle Grow to, to water your plants every couple of weeks. Um, if you don't like that, then you can use fish emulsions or other organic uh, fertilizers. And usually it tells you on the bag um, how much to add, you know, per plant or, you know, per area of a garden. So follow those directions on that. And I think usually, I don't know, how often do you apply fertilizer for tomatoes and ground, Ashley? Like when you, just after you plant them, when they flower? Yeah, yeah. it depends on what the source is, as uh, Sherry was saying. If, um, if you're doing like a water soluble, uh, a fertilizer, something that you're mixing in like your watering can or your watering bucket, um, you know, I would say once every two to three weeks is not going to be too much because there's very uh, small amounts in those types of products. Um, if you're doing, you know, something like a triple, triple 10, you know, fertilizer, if you do that at the beginning of the season and maybe, you know, midway through, you just kind of have to take your cues from your plants. If they're nice and healthy and dark green and growing well, then that's probably a good indication that they're doing okay fertilizer wise. Yeah, and I would say, I would caution people against adding too much fertilizer, um, especially like, you know, when the fruit is, is forming, I don't think you should be adding, you know, a heavy duty fertilizer at that point because you're gonna encourage um, a lot of leafy growth. And, you know, so you don't fertilize too much either. Yeah, another, and, and it came up again about when's the best time to, to water your plants. So again, with tomatoes, if you can water them in the morning, morning hours are going to be better than, than evening uh, to help kind of limit the fungal, fungal diseases. And you can also, um, you know, any leaves that are touching the soil surface, I would recommend taking those off. Um, you know, maybe not the day you plant them, but yeah, um, you know, throughout the growing season, the less amount of you know, the more amount of space that you have between the lower leaves and the soil, the better so that you don't get any, any of that soil splashing up on the leaves that could potentially cause fungal diseases. Okay. <clears throat> I'm just looking to see if there's um, any other major questions here. Do we still have people online? Yeah, we do. <clears throat> okay. Um, now, there's a couple of questions about vertical growing. I'm, I'm guessing they're asking about like growing tomatoes upside down from hanging pots. Is, is that your take, Ashley? I would think, yes. Do you have anything to, to talk about with that? I mean, I don't think it's any different um, than growing up, you know, on a pot sitting on the floor. You just, you know, make sure right. you keep it watered and fertilized. Yeah. The main problem that I've seen with those systems is that it's like a one gallon container usually yeah. that's in the air. I've never seen a huge container. So usually again, your, your tomato is probably not going to have enough room to grow in those systems. So if you're going to do something like that, I'd recommend a cherry variety or a bush variety, something that's going to be small. Um, you'll tend to have less problems with the cherry tomato because they're going to mature quicker. Um, and you'll get more fruit off of something like that. Yeah. Um, somebody asked a question, is, would slake lime burn tomatoes? I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about putting it in the planting hole. I would say yes. It's extremely caustic. I don't think I would um, do that. Um, and, and people are asking about how to deter groundhogs and squirrels, which I didn't get to the squirrel question because that's a hard one. So I'll talk about groundhogs first. Um, really, you get for groundhogs, there's a couple of different things you can do. You're gonna need to fence your tomatoes to exclude the groundhogs from getting to your tomatoes. And they dig. So what you need to do is you need to sink your fence down into the ground at least a foot. And then you would bend it so that you have it um, at least a foot of fence going out away from the garden. So as the gr groundhog is digging down, he's gonna encounter that fence, um, you know, 
as he's digging vertically down. So, I mean, this requires a lot of planning and digging. It's pretty difficult to do this. And also they do climb. So one thing you can do is kind of leave the fence floppy at the top, not attached to your post uh, and bent out away from your garden. So when they try to climb it, um, it's too floppy. They can't hang on, they fall down. So those are a couple of things, but probably the best thing to do is to trap them and remove them. So I know that's harsh, but um, they can be a real problem. You have anything else to add, Ashley? No, that's like you said, it's, it's a hard one and they can do a lot of damage in a short amount of time when they're hungry. That's for sure. Yeah. And uh, I see a couple questions. Of, yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> okay. I just see a couple questions about using multiple, uh, like multiple treatments, multiple insecticide, neem oil, as well as surround. Um, I'm going to say probably there's no prescription that we can give you that you need to use all three of these at the same time. It's really uh, just very site specific for what you're seeing. Um, if you're not having issues with anything, then I wouldn't apply anything other than a fungicide, a preventative fungicide on my tomatoes. Um, but that being said, if if you're having multiple problems, then it is okay to, to use multiple tactics, if that makes sense. Would you think, Sherry? Yeah, and, and you also, you have to tailor the products that you're using to the particular problem pest issue that you know that you have to the specific insect or the well diseases generally there are just a few chemicals that you can use as a preventative measure so um, but yeah especially with um, insects you really have to be able to um, correctly identify the insect and what stage of development it, it is and then you can apply that knowledge to choose the appropriate pesticide or strategy to, to eliminate that insect. Um, so yeah, I agree with Ashley. There's not a one size fits all at all. And I'm gonna just enter, I've entered our email addresses in here a couple different times in the chat. Uh, you'll also have them uh, in the, the PDF that we send out. Uh, but please, if we missed your question or if you, you know, if we missed it or we didn't answer it well, or if you have other questions that come up um, as you get into vet to tomato gardening, please just reach out to us. That's why we're here. Um, and we do appreciate you guys, you know, your attention and for, for logging on and supporting us during these webinars. Uh, we've, we've really learned a lot as we went along, that's for sure. And we hope that, that you guys have too. Okay, so are we going to bring this to a close or are we going to keep answering questions? That's up to you. What do you think? <laughs> Let's see. We still got 160 people. <laughs> I say we bring it to a close. Okay. <laughs> it's almost 8 o'clock, so we're... Well, sure. Uh, appreciate you folks hanging on and sticking with us for almost two hours. Appreciate you all, and um, thank you so much. Yes. I will counter that with a thank you very much and uh, don't forget if you want to join us for tea gardening next week please go ahead and and, and do that and uh, visit us on Facebook and share our other other classes so all right you guys have a good evening thanks again bye-bye